The scripture for today will be found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord with all your heart and, um, and all your soul and all your strength um, and love your neighbors as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. But by chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to, this, to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant, assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to, to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Thank you, Elena and Aubrey. Shall we pray, please? Bow our heads together. Father in heaven, please send your Holy Spirit to us now so that the words that were read will be written on our hearts and will be put into practice by your Holy Spirit in our lives. We depend on you for that. That's why we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Is anybody able to tell me what date it is today? October 23rd. Exactly 180, 177 years ago to the day. A group of deeply disappointed and grieving people, Bible believers, gathered in a barn. The barn was in New York State, Western New York State, belonged to a man called Hiram Edson. And Hiram writes about that day and he says that our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted. And we were in a state of weeping such as I have never experienced before in my life. Why? Jesus did not return to earth as they believed he would. They gathered in this barn the next day. They believed he would come the previous day. And on the 23rd in that morning, they were gathered there, resorting to prayer in their disappointment with their tears flowing, praying, pleading with God, what now? And soon after their prayers had progressed quite a bit, Hiram Edson felt impressed that he should walk over to the neighbors to encourage them. And he took his friend, Owen Crossier, with him and they walked through the field, they actually they walked through the cornfield. And suddenly Hiram stopped and stared straight ahead of himself. And his friend Owen said, why do you stop? And Hiram replied, I believe God is hearing our morning prayers. I'm receiving some light, I believe, about and regarding our deep disappointment. 
And that began five months of intense study. And at the end of that five months, Hiram and his wife sold their, their precious silverware to fund the printing of publication of their, of their study. And I have here with me today a publication that was, uh, it's dated 1999. It's a publication called Restoration of the Apost Apostolic Church. And it is written by uh, one of you. Well, none of you, but there he is. Dr. Ron Thompson. Raise your hand, Ron, and they'll know where you are so they can come to you afterwards and ask for your autograph. <laughs> Here it is, Restoration of the Apostolic Church by Ron Thompson. You know what this is? This is a full and positive account of the Millerite movement, which ended in that disappointing experience of October the 22nd, 1844. This copy is going to be in the library, and you can uh, loan it from there and read this remarkable story, which God did not abandon his people, but used in order to teach them humility so that they would go on studying and discover so much more, so much more. This is written in a way that would meet the minds of evangelical thinking people today. And thank you for writing it and making us aware of it. Also there in the narthex, we've placed a sheet of paper that Dr. Ron Thompson prepared to compare the Millerite view to what Hiram Edson came up with in his study. You may want to pick that up. It's under the television over there. 177 years ago. I'm deeply thankful that the Seventh Adventist Church has grown significantly in our understanding of what happened then. Our understanding of this heavenly judgment that began. In fact, we've now come to understand better as we continue to grow in our understanding. That we believe that Jesus in judging is judging in favor of his blood-bought followers. In favor of them. There is blood-bought children and because their names are written in heaven, indeed because their names are written in heaven, they are transformed and they, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are loving like Jesus loved. Loving the least, loving the lowest with the power of the Holy Spirit because their names are written in heaven. And Jesus is affirming that. And Jesus is declaring them safe to save because they trust in his sacrifice for them. And that has transformed their lives into so that they become people who love not like we normally think of love, but loving sacrificially like Jesus, the least and the lowest. As if they're loving them, as if that is Jesus himself whom they are loving. That's what's happening there. And I believe that in Luke chapter 10, verse is it 25 to 37 today? That is what is taught. So let's look at that. But first there's a setting. You know, before Jesus told that story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 verse 17. Luke there tells us that the 72 disciples had returned from their mission trip. And they brought this very exciting report to Jesus. They were emotionally so joyful. Telling Jesus how that even the demons obeyed them as they used his name. Can you just sense how they were bubbling over with excitement? 
And then Jesus responds and says to them, you know, what you've done there, using my power, just shows the defeat of Satan. But careful now, my friends, Jesus says, I want you to make very sure that your success and your achievement and your power is not the basis of your joy or your identity or your destiny. I want you to make sure that in good days or bad days, what really brings you joy and meaning in life and assurance is that your names are written in heaven. Make sure of that. Make sure of that. In other words, Jesus is saying, your name is not written in heaven because you do good things in my name, with my power. He is saying that you do good things in my name with my power because your name is written in heaven. Decisive difference. Now, if you were here last week, you would have heard Pastor Ryan say this in a very profound and very powerful way. And if you didn't hear it, it's still recorded. You can go online and find it. Crucial point that Jesus was making here. I'm so glad Pastor Ryan is uh, our lead pastor. He lifts Jesus up faithfully. I am learning a lot from him. I'm learning a lot from Pastor James, like not jumping off rocks into deep <laughs> waters and so on. Seriously, I'm learning a lot from them. I wish I had them around a lot earlier in my life. But here are the, these, these people listening to Jesus saying this very strange thing to them. And that is that having your name in heaven is not a reward for your doing good things in my name. When they heard Jesus say that, these people were thinking to themselves, we've not heard that before. That's different. We've always been told that we will be rewarded by being given a place with God in heaven because we faithfully do the commandments of the, of the law, the law of Moses. And here is somebody who is saying just the very opposite. And among those hearing Jesus say that was an expert in the law. This is a specialist in the law of Moses, the Torah, first five books of the, of the Bible. And as he was listening to Jesus saying that, he felt like it was his duty. He couldn't let Jesus get away with bringing such a way off teaching to these people. And he decides that he's going to stand up to Jesus, challenge him. And in fact, the Bible says in Luke 10, 25, he stood up at, to test Jesus, to test Jesus. He's skilled. He's skilled in knowing the law, in interpreting the law, in explaining the law, and in applying the law. This man was the expert in town. No one would dare debate him at all. And he must have cringed when he just earlier, than, a few moments earlier, heard Jesus say, I am sent from my father. And if you reject me, you're rejecting God. He heard Jesus say that. He must have cringed when he heard that. And then he heard Jesus saying to his father, Father, I thank you that you have hidden these things about having your name written in heaven. I thank you that you have kept this, hidden it from the wise, the educated, the intelligent, and you've given it to little humble children. He cringed when he heard that because he believed he was one of the wise, one of the educated, one of the intelligent. He's an expert in the law. And here he's thinking in his mind, this man, Jesus, claiming to be the Messiah. And claiming that I, the educated, the expert in the law, I do not know what God's plan is for how to have my name written in heaven. How dare he? I'm the expert around here, and I have a bombshell of a question to throw at him. And here's the question. Teacher, what must I do to inher inherit eternal life? 
Well, Jesus knew that this expert in the law was all about doing the law of Moses in order to be rewarded and be given a place in heaven. Jesus knew he was all about the law. So Jesus meets him where he is and Jesus gives him the answer by giving him a question. And here's his question. Jesus says to him, well, what is the law? What does the Torah say? You're all about the law. So what does the law say? How you will inherit eternal life. How do you read it? That's an easy question. Expert in the law. He's got it right there. And he quotes the law. Word for word. He takes it from Deuteronomy chapter 6. verse. Well for us it's 6 verse 5. And Leviticus 19 verse 18. And he, he just gives it perfectly. Word for word. And he says well that says. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, with all your mind, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. Easy answer. And what does Jesus say? <laughs> right. You got it right. 100%. Check mark right there. Do this, expert in the law. Do this, and you will live. You know, it's got to feel very good to have Jesus look you in the eye and say, you got it right. Have Jesus say that. The problem is, you may get the words right, but the meaning of the words you may not be getting right. And Jesus wanted to just shake his foundations a little bit. What is it in these words found in Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19? What is in these verses that Jesus told him he must do in order to live? That means eternal life. What is in there? Think with me for a moment. Look at those words once again. <laughs> love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. What is it that he must do? That really means, and it is not foreign for any rabbi, any student of the Torah to say to you, this means that you are obligated in your thoughts, your motives, your ambitions, your emotions, your actions, your decisions, all the time, fully and completely, without reserve, without one failure, to fully, without fail, express love to God and to your neighbor all the time, because one slip puts, gr puts guilt in charge. That's what it means. And he knew that. And Jesus is saying to this lawyer, this expert in the law, you keep loving God in this way, in this perfect way, without a single break, and you will live forever. Do this, and you will live. Absolutely. Jesus is right. It's a fair command to love God in that way. The question is, how many Bible characters do you know have loved God in that way? Even your favorite has not. How well have you done loving God so fully with your mind, your emotions, your intentions, your everything fully, without fail? How have you done with that? Have you tried that for a day? Have you succeeded for a day? I mean, what? A whole lifetime. Just try a day. How about an hour? How about one second? You see, what Jesus is doing here, he's illustrating, he's bringing this man to the point where in honesty, he would admit that he needs more than his doing. More than his loving. More than his attempts to keep the law. 
Steps to Christ says, since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. Cannot. But that statement says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. And your neighbor is yours. Love who? The Lord your God. That name Lord, which in many of the translations has four capital letters. In the Hebrew, it's Y-H-W-H. It's unpronounceable. It's the name God gave of himself to Moses. It's the covenant name for God. And that name for God there means that it is the Lord the unchanging covenant God who loved you even before time began. That Lord. And then it says it's the Lord your God. And the word God there means that he is the almighty who engages all his power to rescue his children from evil. So locked into these two names, the Lord your God is the gospel who loves you with a covenant love that cannot fail. He calls it the everlasting love that will never change. And he's the one that engages all his power to rescue you from evil. It is that gospel-giving, generous God of love and mercy that you are to love with all your heart. So that if you do fail, it's not the judge with anger and with vengeance that is going to come down on you. It is the Lord God who loves you with an everlasting love who catches you when you fall, who recovers you, who draws you to himself. So that actually, this expert in the law missed the very core of that statement that he memorized so well. That he could explain, but he missed something. You know what he missed? He missed the fact that God is more generous than I am good. God is more generous than I am loving. God is more gracious than I am obedient. He missed that. He missed that. What if, this, what if this man, in hearing Jesus say, do this and you will live, realized the high standard, the impossible, and the impossibility for him to achieve that, if he fell down at the feet of Jesus and said, Lord, I want to do it, I've tried to do it, but I fail over and over again, be merciful to me, a sinner. What would have happened if he did that? Mark Twain said, heaven goes by favor. If heaven was by merit, you would stay out and your dog would go in. He knew the gospel. But this man, this expert in the law, instead of him falling in humility before Jesus and asking for his power to live through him, instead of that, his response is another question. Who is my neighbor? Now that says a lot about this man, because he is saying to keep the law, to do the law, I need to know who my neighbor is. And the mere fact that he wants a definition of his neighbor before he begins to love anybody proves that he knows nothing about love, because love has no limit. The question is not, who is my neighbor? The question is, do I have a heart that is loving? It is easier to be religious than to be gracious. And this man knew nothing about that. But he knew the law. He knew the law. And for those Jewish people, your neighbor excluded a Samaritan. It excluded a Gentile. It excluded the outcasts. 
So he already had narrowed it right down. And when he's asking Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus answers this question by telling the story of the Good Samaritan. About a dying Jew and a Good Samaritan. Now I want you to remember, at the end of the story, Jesus repeats something to this man. He had just said to him, do this and you will live. At the end of the story, Jesus again looks at this man and he says, you now go and do as the Samaritan has done. Giving him another opportunity to be an honest, humble man and fall at the feet of Jesus and saying, I know I must do it. I know I should do this, but I don't know how. I have tried, but I cannot. In fact, I love so poorly, I exclude people from being my neighbor. Again, Jesus gives him that opportunity. So I'm just wondering, is Jesus telling us in the story to do what we can only do when we put our full trust in him for what he has done for us, and then depending on the working of the Holy Spirit through us to obey, to love. And that's what's in the story. That means this story is not about some people from way back then. This story is about you and me and Jesus. So let's tell the story. It goes like this. All of us are dying from wounds that the evil one has inflicted on us. We have forsaken Jerusalem, the city of peace, and we've headed for Jericho, the cursed city, which you read about in, yes, Joshua chapter 6, 1 Kings 16. It's the cursed city. We have left the city of peace, gone into, towards the city of crime, the city of curse. That's the story. And like Adam, when we left the presence of God, we fell into the hands of the chief robber and murderer, as Jesus calls him. We were stripped by the evil one of the robe of righteousness that we were given. Our wounds ooze with sin after sin like a never-ending stream. That's us. But despite all this, we are not totally lifeless. The image of God is not completely obliterated. We still have some sense of right or wrong. We still have a sense that something must change. We need help. We want something better. But something is terribly wrong. Our case is desperate and we cannot help ourselves. Just like that dying Jew. We depend on another to come and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Another who has compassion on us. Not because we deserve it, but simply because that other is compassionate by nature. The law came and looked over us and saw us lying there in our state, desperate. And the law saw our wounds, and the law was overwhelmed by the extent of our wounds, and the law gave up, and knowing I cannot do anything for this wretched person. And the law moved on. Religion came and looked over us and saw our wounds, and religious people simply say, I have something better to do. Because it's easier to be religious than it is to be gracious. And moved on, left us there to die. Only the true Samaritan, Jesus, despised and rejected, he was moved with compassion, seeing us in our desperate state. He did not remain in his holy, happy heaven where all was good and all the angels worshipped him. No, he's moved, he was moved with compassion and he did not want to pass us by 
And he gave up all of that so that he could come and identify himself with us. He gave us all he had to rescue us. He held nothing back. And as he picked us up and bound our wounds, he carries us and puts us on his donkey and brings us to the church. The church which is so often called the hospital, the place where sin sick sinners find healing as those in the church dispense the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and then our good Samaritan went on a journey and entrusted us with all the provisions he has given entrusted us to the tender gentle, merciful, kind treatment by the church until he should return. Now I want to give credit to Pastor James here. He made an excellent point this week when he said that the Samaritan told the innkeeper that if he runs out of the money he provided, that he, the Samaritan, would be good for the rest. Meaning that you could never overdraw on the provisions of Jesus. He is good for all the grace you need. Only Pastor James said it better than I've just said it. That's a powerful statement. Jesus is our good Samaritan. But he is also the dying Jew on the side of the road. Paul Dibdal published in the Adventist Review just here in September. He's a professor at Walla Walla University. He was looking at the story and here's what he says. That Jesus knew that he would be traveling the same road from Jericho to Jerusalem towards where he would be crucified. And Jesus, knowing that, he tells this story to show that the wounded man by the side of the road actually foreshadows his own experience, Jesus' own experience. So now we know Jesus also found himself among thieves and robbers. There was one on each side of him as he hung on the cross. Jesus also was stripped of his clothes. He was also beaten, abandoned, and left for dead. He was flogged and crucified. And no one cared that his life was cut short. He was despised and rejected. We turned, as it were, our backs on him and looked the other way, says Isaiah 53. Jesus the wounded, bleeding Jew. Priests and religious leaders were supposed to defend him and protect him, but no, they plotted to kill him. They left him to suffer and die. His bruised and his broken body was wrapped and anointed by unexpected people of compassion. The man in the story began his journey on foot but concluded his trip on the back of a donkey belonging to someone else. Even so, Jesus headed to Jerusalem on foot but then with a triumphal entry, he was on the back of a donkey belonging to someone else. Story ends well. Because the dying Jew was, as it were, restored to new life. And Jesus rose from the dead to new life. He is the Good Samaritan. He is the dying Jew. How wonderful it is to look at Jesus. For a moment we see ourselves and we lose hope until we see Jesus 
so integrated in our story that we must have hope, and we do. And what we discover is this wonderful Jesus is wonderful because of who he is and because of what he has done. He has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. This is the gospel. The gospel is it is done. It is not do. It's what Jesus has done for you that saves you, that transforms you. Makes you a kind of person who can love with compassion from the heart, even as the good Samaritan, who loved in a perfect love. James Proctor puts it this way. He says, cast your deadly doing down at the feet of Jesus. Stand in him, in him alone. Gloriously complete. Gloriously complete in Jesus. And so in his sanctuary, working the judgment, Jesus is looking at his blood-bought people. Those whose names are written in heaven because they trust in what the Son of God has done for them. And as he looks at their record in heaven, Jesus sees these blood-bought people trusting in what he has done for them to rescue them from evil. And he sees in them also himself. They are transformed as the result of their trust in him. They are transformed into people who now care with compassion for the least of these. And they are sharing love where there is hatred. They are sharing love when it is, they are expected to retaliate in defense. They are showing love rather than trying to win the argument, trying to be better than someone else, even quoting scripture like the law expert. They show love when it costs them everything. Because they have fallen at the feet of Jesus. Knowing the command is beyond their ability on their own. And they say, be merciful to me, Jesus, for I am a sinner. And Jesus lifts them up and he says... I give you my Holy Spirit. I give you my Holy Spirit not as a reward, but as a generous gift, because in a humble heart, a submissive heart, acknowledging that there is no good thing I can do, but there is every good thing that He has done for me and that the Holy Spirit will do through me. That's the wonderful Jesus. That's the wonderful Jesus, where the Holy Spirit does through you what Jesus has done for you. You see, the love of Jesus, Christ's love, is such that it alone can produce the same love in us and through us. And so friends, to the extent, to the extent that you adore him, to the extent that you cultivate an amazement of what he has done, to that extent, you will be bound with bonds of love. It will be evident to the world that God does have a people who are like Jesus, who show his love where it seems impossible. Let's not do. Let's rest in what is done.